Um, our event today is co-sponsored by the Digital Humanities Center here in Butler Library and also as part of the Paul F. Lazarsfeld Lecture Series. Um, and that series, I'll use their exact language, um, celebrates Lazarsfeld's commitment to improving methodological approaches that address concerns of vital cultural and social significance. Um, so it's great to have Doug's work included on that. Um, and so let me give you a little bit of background on Doug Boyd. He's back with us. He was part of the faculty for our summer institute last year. Um, and has been involved with SECO in a number of different ways over the years. So we're really thrilled to have him here for this special lecture. Um, he now serves as the director of the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at University of Kentucky Libraries. And he's currently directing the IMLS National Leadership Grant, uh, OMS, Enhancing Access and Discovery of Oral History Online. And that's what he'll be talking about tonight. Um, he recently managed the Oral History in the Digital Age project, which I can say, uh, as a professor of oral history, is sort of the most important resource for anything digital that you're trying to learn about in oral history. It is constantly evolving and really a, a touchstone for a lot of important conversations in the field. Um, and that was a national initiative exploring uh, current best, pra best practices for collecting, curating, and disseminating oral histories. Um, he recently published a book, Crawfish Bottom, Recovering a Lost Kentucky Community, um, which was really pathbreaking in that it explored the use of archived oral histories in new contexts, which is um, something really rare. We always archive oral histories and hope that other people will come along and use them, but I think we don't oft very often think um, clearly and critically about that process. And that's something that uh, was really important that Doug did. Um, and he's also the Digital Initiatives Editor of the Oral History Review. Uh, his MA and PhD are in folklore from Indiana, and Henry Glassie was his advisor, which will resonate with a lot of you in the audience, I think. Um, so I'll turn it over to you. Nice. Uh, thank you so much for coming, and enjoy. Well, thanks also, for having me. I'm going to pass around the sign up sheet. Thanks, thanks for me. having me. I'm the, you know, the, the OHDA, the Oral History and Digital Age Project, um, is also uh, um, coming out as the next special issue of the Oral History Review. So. Um, there's 14 articles, which I, I, I mean, was an all-time high for the Oral History Review. Um, and uh, I'm not sure when that comes out. It's turned in, which is a great relief of stress <laughs> for me. Um, uh, but, uh, but really a nice, you know, because that takes it into the scholarly conversation. Um, uh, some of these, you know, so it's not so much a how-to as much as it's really sort of thinking about uh, or the history of the digital age, essentially from a scholar perspective, which is really fun. Um, so that's my plug. I do have to plug the Oral History of the Digital Age website again, in the sense that, um, in in a way, just to sort of set up a disclaimer uh, for myself, um, it is a wonderful sort of nexus for collecting, curating, and disseminating oral history. Um, uh, really, the technical side. You know, it's not a how-to. It's it's really about in, in terms of interviewing. Um, but it very much tried to speak to, um, if you came in early and you heard me talking to the class, uh, you know, thinking through oral history from a, um, you know, and I'll reveal too much about myself by saying this, from a tall, grande, and venti structure, because we have oral history like the Shoah Foundation with an enormous budget, and oral history like a county historical society with no budget. And, and how can we write a best practices or create a best practices platform that, that speak to and work for both of those, those entities? And I think we really did a good job. We created a video, much of which the video, much of the video is shot actually here uh, at Columbia downstairs in the, in the uh, in Amy's office actually now. Um, but uh, uh, so we have you know, video interviews with, with some experts, um, access to over 200 best practices. The Ask Doug thing is my disclaimer. I didn't call it that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if you haven't seen it, I, I do because I've been leading the, the How to Record workshops for 10 years at the, at the thing. And so I get maybe 200 phone calls a year from people saying, what recorder do I buy? And so I've honed the process of, of determining what the best recorder for you is because there's, I've narrowed it down to 21 questions that I essentially would ask you if you called me. Um, and um, and so we automated that. So it's kind of like eHarmony.com. You know, <laughs> if you answer these questions, I'm going to match you up with your your soul mate recorder. It really um, works. And what? It works. It does. It actually works. So um, uh, so, but I didn't want to call it that stuff. They they did that to me. Um, but uh, but again, the idea is how can we empower 
uh, people to make decisions for themselves? How can we give you the kind of information that's not just going to have you memorize, okay, I need to record at this standard, but really help you to understand why and, and empower uh, even people who see themselves as just interviewers, um, who, who need to know uh, a little bit about the curating side of things in order, you know, now that you know, the digital age is, is really integrated the, the, the different processes and phases of world history, so it's really important. So, I think about world history a lot, you know, using this, you know, this is the tree falling in the forest, um, uh, who comes on available. We just transferred over windows. This is a really cool animation. I worked really hard on it. Um, but the idea of the tree falling in the forest, you know, we're interviewing people and saving these stories, and this is really great. But after years of being in the archive, <coughs> what drives me nuts is we do these interviews to put these individual stories onto the historical record. And what drives me nuts is going to an archive or, or looking in my own archive and seeing interviews that were conducted on cassette in 1974 with the best of intentions to get these stories out there, and they have sat on a shelf until 2012. Maybe two people have pulled these cassettes and listened to them. Um, that was not the original intention of oral history, uh, I think. Um, I think the idea was, you know, was, was one that eventually, not every interview, now it needs to be on the internet and searchable and whatnot, and that's my disclaimer for the rest of the presentation. But, well, but, but you know, eventually these interviews were, were originally conducted for access. I and mean, I'd go to a repository and see a collection of interviews, with World War I interviews, still on reel to reel with no backup and no machine on the facility, at the facility to play back those interviews. And that's, you know, that, that, I think that, that's something that underlies my entire philosophy in terms of, of an archival approach. And that's what I'm sort of talking about here is an archival approach. Another disclaimer, if you get a $2 million grant, you can do anything <laughs> with oral history for, for a small project, for a fixed project. You can do such amazing things if you can hire a programmer. Uh, you can do amazing things, but what we've proven time and time again are these one-off boutique projects aren't sustainable in terms of, in terms of uh, I've created myself unsustainable tools that, that, that that you know now need a grant in order to bring them back to life, which is really sad. And so I think uh, as we sort of merge into this new model of archiving, um, uh, uh, we really need to think about sustainability as an underlying principle because this was the model before. The interview goes, the interviews go into this box, and the user takes off work or comes into you know to your research room to listen to hours and hours, and that just doesn't you know that's just not really the dominant um, model for conducting research today, uh, for better or worse. And so, from an archival perspective, I'm constantly thinking about you know, how we can serve these folks <laughs> in an effective and efficient way. You know, not just throwing something up there. You know, our collection catalog, which this is a thumbnail from, we put it online, it gets 10,000 page views a month now. You know, for an oral history collection in Kentucky. You know, you, Google Analytics tell us amazing things about who's using these collections, and and it really uh, is remarkable. And I've been thinking a lot about this idea of triangulation, and and its role in this whole process. And, I, and just to give you an anecdote, this um, this interview. I've told like four of you this already, so I'm sorry. But this interview, Marshall Webb. It's just a, just a World War II veteran who, who talks about his experience. Um, he was interviewed back in 86. It's actually not a great interview um, uh, from a, uh, uh, from a um, technical standpoint. You know, he doesn't remember a lot of things and, and, and whatnot, but it's also a really beautiful interview. He wrote poetry about his experiences as a veteran and he read it on, on, uh, in the interview. Well. This is just one of you know 500 or so interviews we have with World War II veterans, you know, and it's got decent metadata. So I told you our, our catalog's getting 10,000 hits, page views, page views a month. Um, I get this email last week. This is yeah last week um, 
from a researcher in Italy who is from this town, Tremensuoli, Tremensuoli. Um, and he had taken a photograph. There's a wall in this town that were signed by all of these American GIs, and you can see this for life. He connected this to this. We sent him, we, we actually uploaded the audio. <coughs> this one's not online yet. We uploaded the audio within like 20 minutes. He had the audio and had access. And that just that was amazing. He subsequently put it on Flickr. I, I, I found it on Flickr because I was just trying to find the town, so I actually signed, you know, that this he had actually tagged it appropriately, so I was able to find this picture. And I was like, wait a minute, Google searches my hard drive? Because I had the picture for the PowerPoint on my hard drive. And I was like, I typed Google and I had this really moment of like disconnect. And I was like, oh my god, it's on Flickr. Oh. And then I had this moment of like, it really take the picture. And then I realized that's him that, that, that uploaded it. So of this wall where all these American GIs signed their name, he tracked it down to this guy. He's, a, he's writing a, a novel about this battle in his small town. So cool. So, you know, the idea of connecting, that making that kind of connection is really transformative. Imagining that in the analog domain um, was really almost unimaginable, I think, to, to you know, um, to make that kind of quick connection like that. I mean, classic example, again, is, you know, this, another World War II veteran talking about his experience in Buchenwald. Liberating Buchenwald, this was actually you know, in my collection, even though I have 500 veterans, this is kind of miscellaneous. This is, you know, this one little factoid that takes up maybe seven minutes of this interview, that's, that's kind of miscellaneous. But the idea that we can then connect to the Shoah Foundation's range of 700 interviews just about the world suddenly brings major significance to the seven minutes in my collection. You know, and that's where when we talk about oral history, I'm preaching to the choir when I talk about the fact that you know, it could be just seven minutes in an interview that, that resonates with your research. But your research is going to pull out you know, information from the 25th minute and, you know, and, and, and likewise. Um, and so the idea of being empowered today to be able to connect people not just to interviews but to moments is really exciting. Um, and that, comes from a long period of struggle, I think, for me, from an archival perspective of failing, feeling like I'm failing at connecting researchers to this content. And I'll tell you why. We have interviews, we have 9,000 interviews, it's about 20,000 hours. Average 200 to 500 new a year, last year we brought in 800. Um, um, now there's state, regional, national, and international topics uh, in our collection. When I took over, we had majority still analog, we had very few transcripts created, um, very limited metadata. Has anybody interacted with an archival collection, oral history collection, that has just collection level data? So, you know, you're interested in civil rights and you're, you've got a collection of 700 interviews on civil rights and the collection level description says this interview contains, interview, or this collection contains interviews about the civil rights movement in New York City. Good luck. You know? um, I mean, it really is like saying, hey, I'm going to be in Berlin over Thanksgiving. Hey, me too. I'll see you there. You know, I mean, you're, you know, it's the odds are against you. And, and so, so, but none of us have the kind of money from an archival standpoint to process things um, and to transcribe everything. Uh, very few of us do. And it's very time consuming. It's cumbersome. Oral history is a really uh, cumbersome information package. Um, it's time-based. It's hard to use as a researcher because you have to, if it's not if it's not transcribed, you can't search it, so you have to listen to it or watch it. You know, um, and in this sort of the, the, the culture that in which we live is is more and more expecting and demanding efficiency. And in, in search and discovery, thanks to Google, right? I mean, I get maybe you know three comments a month from from patrons who are like, "When's the whole collection going to be online?" And I'm thinking, you know, 2050. Um, but but I think 
there's the idea of efficiency, the idea of a massive amount of information. It's hard to describe an interview from a met metadata standpoint and distill it down, but, but it's necessary and it's expensive, obviously. Sorry for the, for the transition. But um, we also have to think, and we learned from the digital, or the stream digital age projects, from surveys and whatnot, and, you know, we're thinking about this a lot in higher ed because the people who are now coming into our classrooms think very differently than a lot of uh, the professors who are teaching the courses, um, myself included. I grew up, I've had an Apple computer since I was 12, but I didn't have the internet, and that changes things in terms of the way that people think. These kids, this, this, this one here mastered the iPad within you know, seven minutes. The operating system understood how to use it. Um, the oldest one, um, I'll never forget this moment where my wife, they have a, so, it's not, it, you know, social networking for kids is really uh, not kind of creepy. Um, but they're coming out with these toys that are integrated with social networks just for, where you, you know, a, a friend can friend, a, a real friend could friend a, um, a real friend, and then they can just interact just the two of them. They both have, what is that toy? It's a, it's a little stuffed animal. Anyway, not, not important for this talk. They're trying to make it work at my house. Charlotte's friend, my wife can't make it work. Charlotte's friend is like, have you, to my wife, says, have you updated your version of Safari? Because it requires the latest version of Safari in order to work. <laughs> my wife just, you know, these kids think differently than we do, and we need to think about how we're structuring our archives. But not only that, we need to think about, you know, we need to think about how we're structuring our archives and our dissemination when we're interviewing and when we're designing a project, because these projects are going to be, um, if, they're, if they're going to be accessible, they're going to be really accessible in ways that we in this room can't even imagine today in the next five years, and that's really exciting. So we developed Spoke, which is our online catalog to solve the problem of, of, of metadata. It's got efficient ways to embed metadata into the interviews in really cool ways. It's Google optimized, it's getting hits. But it's really usable uh, in, in a very cool way, which is important because when things aren't usable, and I can't tell you how many archival catalogs are completely, it's like they don't pay attention to you know, web trends, you know, that, that, that search is clunky and, and it, 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 you know, this generation expects Amazon, expects the seamless search in Google, expects I want to be able to download something from iTunes and listen to it. So, you know, as we come back to this idea of, you know, they want to search, they want to explore, um, and we need to empower them to do so, uh, to create situations like Marshall Webb's interview, or to jump to from Marshall Webb's interview to our From Combat to Kentucky project, and and look and and be able to see that uh, there are all these wonderful interviews with returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan who are now students. So, but this is the problem: is the online catalog isn't the digital repository. That freaks people out. Putting this online, I'm telling you, even my own students in my graduate class are like, "Well, I found I found the interview, but I couldn't get to it." I was like, "Well, that's because it's not been digitized yet." You know, this is the catalog. Remember those? You know, I mean, really, it's, it's a really difficult uh, thing to convince them, but she's going to expect that. So, so we really have created sort of portals to the digital objects in, I think, really exciting ways. And I think you're able to, and I have these three different things that show up depending on the way that you're going to interact with the energy when you come through our catalog. And it's really cool, our catalog dynamically gives you a button that's customized to whether the interview's been transcribed, whether the interview's been indexed, whether the interview is, is searchable, whether it's just browsable. Um, so, and that is really a direct correlation to the fact that I've worked with systems uh, over the years that are just clunky. And it's re this is being recorded, so I'm not going to name any of them. Um, uh, but digital library, digital library platforms were created for photographs and for manuscripts. They fail miserably, still, at really accommodating the needs of an oral history. Um, uh, you know, the, the idea of handling time-based media, the idea of handling such a massive amount of metadata that really is what a transcript is, 
you know, really uh, frustrates them. And so there's been some really clunky approaches to that. Um, the also, I think the barrier of the transcript is really important to, to point out too. Uh, the barrier of the transcript has been really holding a lot of collections back over the years. Um, the idea that we have to transcribe it to make it efficient. You know, and, and I use this example a lot now because it's so useful um, in demonstrating this, but we created this fancy system called OMS that I'm about to show you. We're about to put, a, put an interview out um, from our um, uh, project with the Supreme Court Justice. And as you can imagine, it's that case law being cited throughout, so-and-so versus so-and-so, so-and-so versus so-and-so. This interview had gone through our process. Of course, it, was, it, uh, it had gone through the process. It was in the digital pile that was labeled. These had been audited. These, somebody went through and made sure this transcript, was, the spellings were correct and whatnot. It wasn't done under my watch. But we inherited this one. But it was what supposedly went through this process. And my undergraduate worker you know, calls me and says, Dr. Boyd, I don't think this is right. She's going through the final process of syncing which isn't even listening to the interview. She's, she's embedding time code into this transcript using OMS, and it's a landmark case, Maryland versus Virginia. But the transcript said Maryland versus vagina. <laughs> now, now, I'd like to think that the transcriber didn't hear that, that it was, a, I, I think it was a spell check error. I think that whoever audited or edited this transcript actually caught a spelling and did an autocorrect and it was closer to vagina than it was to Virginia. But when we think about this, the burden that we carry in transcription of perfection, you know, because if I put it out there as a transcript, 75%, maybe larger amount of researchers are gonna copy and paste the segment that they want and put it in their research. Because if I'm branding it as an uncensored transcript, that's, it's transcript, that, right? That's what they said, and it's not. Uh, even the most vetted transcripts are flawed. And so I've been trying to figure out you know, how we get past that and how we make it more effective. And so when I drew up the initial schematic of Holmes um, and was sort of just sort of thinking, how do I want this sort of seamless integration? How do I want to make sure that if somebody's interacting with the transcript, they're interacting with the moment and they're hearing and we're watching that moment? Uh, and how can we just sort of create a system to be able to do that? And the, the, this is the original version went out and it really was just transcript based. Uh, these are all quick time, so we have to go to the left, don't we? So that's okay. So this was all transcript um, based. So in that transcript, as you're going through, the idea behind the original version of all. Like, like I said before, um, where you're doing. Uh, we search on Fallujah. Oral and obviously video interviews um, for. Iraq, Afghanistan, veterans. Um, if you were to just go ahead and tell me and give me a little brief description. So, almost sort of the, the, the viewer takes you through all the moments, almost like a, a PDF, you know, where you can actually go through and it um, dynamically takes you to all the bits on Fallujah. You say, oh, this is the one I want. And, and pretty confused as, next as far as what was going on. Um, so, really, as far as there's no magic, the close calls and everything. When we actually went into Fusion, we in terms of uh, it's not it's not magic. It really was creating a video game like interface to take a transcript and drop index points in very efficiently and quickly. Um, so you only listen to 10 seconds on every minute, and the bell rings and you click and you've embedded a, trans a, a time code. You go to the next minute, bell rings, you embed the time code, and, and it's, it's it's very efficient way to drop time code into a transcript. Um, and forces the researcher, it doesn't force, but encourages highly the researcher, makes it as easy as we possibly can to A, find the information they're looking for, but B, corroborate it with the original, with, you know, with, with the recording itself, which was very important to me. Um, after watching all of these trends of, of um, so there's a problem with that model. Um, and you know, I you know, I put it on the Kentucky Digital Library. Seven hundred interviews we uploaded using about six six hundred that were transcribed. There's seven hundred on there now. The problem was that OMS was only ours, and the transcripts were too expensive. So I created this thing. The Kentucky, Kentucky is kind of unique in the sense that I mean, we do have all over the state oral history activity because we have something called the Bureau of History Commission, 
the Kentucky Digital Library allows them to put their interviews online. Anybody else could have used OMS during the last three years, but nobody did, because it required a transcript. And I got to thinking about that. And I have an endowment that went underwater, right, during the recession. And I'm thinking, you know what, I can't actually put $10,000 or $20,000 into transcription this year. So what can we do to sort of solve that problem? And then, then there's the idea of keyword searchability. It's not the holy grail. It's not perfect. It's, it's great to have. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But somebody can talk about segregation for three hours without ever mentioning the word segregation. So you're looking, you're researching segregation. What do you have to type in? Water fountain, bus, you know. You know, people don't use public accommodations in everyday speech typically, you know, unless they were a civil rights activist. So, um, in terms of what I've seen. So, so I think struggling with that idea of, of how do we do that, I thought about this. Um, you go to the grocery store and you say, where are the Cheerios? What are they going to tell you? Aisle 10. Aisle whatever. The breakfast aisle. Right? Then what? They don't, they don't really know where the Cheerios are. They though. don't know where the Cheerios are. They, they don't grab your hand, walk you down, you know, turn at the right aisle, walk you down, 117 paces, turn you, set your head at a 45 degree angle because you're only five foot six, and, and reach out and help you grab that. They say aisle 10. You, the smart human being, go find aisle 10. And then when you're in aisle 10, I'm pointing to you, you're smart. Um, you're going, you get into aisle 10, you're going to go look for what? The picture of the Cheerios. Now, I didn't know they actually started doing this heart thing, and that's really appropriate for today. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Um, <laughs> but you look for the yellow box, you look for the O's, right? Smart people, we you know, use language and signs and symbols and, and whatnot to find this. The idea is, could we do that with the oral history interview in an efficient way that was effective for the user without going to the cost of, of that? So starting to do indexing and introducing an indexing module into homes cut my cost by a tenth. I can index an interview for $40, paying an undergraduate or a graduate student to do that work, um, as opposed to $400, which is what it would cost to transcribe that same interview. Um, indexing really allows you to use controlled vocabularies like to solve the segregation and mapping of natural language to solve that segregation issue that, that you know, somebody's talking about segregation, well, you can actually basically catalog that moment and say, you know, they're using these words, but what they're talking about is this. So creating a sort of mapping of natural language is, is an advantage of indexing. Um, uh, OMS allows you now to link out to things, GPS coordinates and whatnot, which is really cool, um, and integrates with Google Maps and such. But, but um, I like, the, I like the, the, the integration of both. But the engaging community thing, I, we're going to talk about this. First, I want to show it to you. So. Marine. Yeah. Yes. So you search Marine. The front end tells you every segment that we talked about Marines in. That's just Joseph that Tyler Gayhart. Takes you to that moment. He says, "You know what? That's a segment I don't want to listen to. I want to talk about his transition home into higher education. I want the click you're taking to that moment." And this is something. When I got out, this is what's really exciting to me because I can now take an interview and enhance access to it for a fraction of the price. And what I have found is I didn't design it for this reason, but what I have found is the best people, you know, to who's got a cool oral history project? Not you, Ron, because you have too many cool ones. So, what's your cool oral history project? Um, the 9-11 Memorial Museum. All right, right. So who are the best people to index those interviews? A bunch of graduate students in Kentucky? Um, New Yorkers. New Yorkers, right? So I give you a password as project director. You can sit on your back porch and drink a latte and index an interview. So instead of transcribing your interview, which we none of us want to do, um, or paying to transcribe an interview, which none of us can do, a lot of us can't do, you can go in and tag these moments. I mean, if you're a researcher and you're going to mine these for, for a dissertation or a book or a documentary, you have to do this anyway. So why not take notes in the system that, that tag those notes to those moments? So 
what I'm doing now is structuring projects where we're actually engaging communities in the curating, curating of these interviews. Uh, so it's not true crowdsourcing. You have to go through my sort of training program on indexing. But when the Oldham County Historical Society gives us a series of interviews um, to uh, put in our repository, it's the Oldham County community that's going to do the better index of those interviews. And so I, I teach them to do that. And suddenly, we're engaging communities on a whole new level of oral history. Before, engaging community in oral history meant interviewing, period. Now, you're actually engaging them in disseminating and curating these interviews. Now, is it a perfect model? No, absolutely not. But again, um, we're not holding the interviews hostage to perfection and with that transcript. We're able to get these out. And the ideal scenario for me is you know, to solve the transcriber index debate by having both. You toggle over. So you want to go deeper and do the same search on the transcript, and wow, you can go to that moment. So the third component that we're going to add to that is to have basically a second transcript slash translation. So if you have a multilingual interview, which more and more of us are, in terms of archives, are bringing in multilingual interviews, you can have a bilingual index or a bilingual transcript. That's not, we haven't done that yet, so, uh, but uh, both of which will be synced and searchable, which is really exciting. Uh, we're going to start um, putting up some of our Haitian Creole interviews with survivors of the Haitian earthquake in 2010 um, in this system, and I'm really jazzed about it. So, so that, I think, really brings me to sort of solving some of those problems um, of, of money. It's still a manual process, right? So the dream of automatic speech recognition is highly flawed by the fact that we can do really nice work using speech recognition um, technologies um, on a perfect recording with someone who has no accent. So we can do, I've seen it, uh, systems that will do um, I know a guy who designed a system that uh, does CNN and Al Jazeera in real, just, just, just shy of real time with about 97% accuracy. Those people have no accents. They've been taught to strip their accents out completely. The recordings are perfect environmentally. The microphones are close and there's no background noise. Um, and so you take that same system down to Harlan County, Kentucky and a recording from the 1970s and it will fail. It will, be more, it will do more harm than it does good. Um, and so, right now, um, so this is sort of a new workflow. There's partial automation. It makes things efficient in sort of allowing you to, to encourage you to use controlled vocabularies. Um, and uh, adds in the community engagement perk, I think, which is really, which is really empowering. Um, my dream, well, first, I, I won't take you to my dream yet. Um, the the um, grant that I'm managing is actually hooking homes up. You know, it's going to be open source. It's going to be free. That's the other thing. Is this is being given away. Um, so that Willamette County can actually, the historical society can use something like this if they have web space. Um, problem with open source is, a lot of times open source means you need, a, it might be free, but you need a programmer. Uh, to implement. And so the idea is not to have that. So we're hooking OMS up out of the box as a plug-in for some of these common platforms um, that are some of the most common platforms people are using for digital archives. So we saw a great demo uh, uh, here from the, what was he? Where was the Digital Humanities Center here? Did a great thing for the students this afternoon on, on Omeka. OMS is going to be a plug-in for Omeka. So instantly transforming Omeka into incredibly sophisticated platform for delivering oral history. But down to a simple website that's hosted on Drupal, which is a really common um, uh, website management uh, platform now. ContentDM is one of the more common library, um, uh, digital library systems that really struggles with oral history and, and doesn't integrate the transcript with, the, with the, the audio or video. They're all separate and it's a very um, difficult process. So. Um, the other thing that sort of underlies my whole philosophy is I've been in systems that I've been stuck in and not able to get my own content out of. And so I, I've been burned by that many times. And so the idea is with OMS, 
there are really super fancy systems out there that allow you to mark up and annotate uh, audio and video, but they don't work with other systems typically. And they're not very interoperable. And so the idea with OMS is it, it exports an XML file, period. That's it. The viewer reads that XML file. But whatever repository you are using in, in the world, you just have to have that XML file. Now XML is something that is every computer now reads um, uh, that's, that's being used. It's something that you could actually save your XML as a CSV and read your data in Excel. Or open up the XML and read it yourself on, on a browser. And so the data is yours. And so the idea was to create something that didn't require ohms to work. Because ohms might not be here in five years. So if you go to the work and trouble to index and time code, sync, and do all of this stuff, you should be able to take that to any system you want. And so the export that you're creating ohms is, is is something that is, is, is very much geared towards interoperability. Um, it's open source because I'm not going to be able to provide 24-7 support. You know, I don't have a call center where you're going to be able to sort of do that. So the idea is that the community is going to, um, to really take that into um, hopefully adopt it. And it's being adopted um, in terms of uh, initially by the grant partners, but the people who are interested in it are really, it's really an exciting mix. So, you know, we're talking about connecting our users to our oral histories. We're, they're discovering our stuff, but then they're, they're not just discovering it, they're able to sort of work with it. This generation, I won't show any more pictures of my kids, but this generation wants to take the stuff and work with it. And you all want to work with it and mess around with it mash it up with something else. And, and I think it's really important that on the archive side that we actually step up and, and create a platform that encourages that um, responsibly, but also effectively and efficiently. And really exciting things are happening right now to solve a lot of these problems. But with the automatic speech recognition, which I get asked a lot about, there's Elmer T. Leo. Sorry I didn't get to show you his, his interview. But I did a pass on Elmer T. Lee's interview um, using speech recognition. Um, and then I took that nasty transcript that was probably about 50% based on just a cursory look. Got about a 50% right. Now, Elmer's got a pretty heavy southern accent. But still, 50% um, is pretty low if you're trying to pass it off as a transcript. That still is in the range that's going to create more work for you to fix than to just transcribe the thing yourself. But if we don't call it a transcript, what if we call that metadata? And we don't show it to the public, but we make it searchable and put it behind an index. So I did a text mining data word count analysis on the automatic. These are the word, these are the big words. I filtered out the ums and the uhs and the elmers and, and those things. But when I filtered all those out, now if I take an archivist off the street, put them that, at that interview, and I said, come up with your subjects and keywords and, and catalog this interview. Talk about plant, bourbon, people, taste, work. We're talking about the business of bourbon. We're talking about warehouses, tasting, brands, distiller. That's actually pretty good. Depiction of, of, uh, of what's actually in that interview. And of course, you can do cool things like the word thing. But you know, if suddenly you as an archivist just had that to look at in order to describe an interview based on automatically generated transcript, you're pretty close to making that interview uh, processed and searchable in a pretty efficient way. So I come back to this idea of, of, of designing our systems and our workflows to, 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 to serve this sort of digital model and expectations. And I, and I come back to this example because I've been thinking about it all day uh, for, for the last two days. Um, and the Marshall Web, you know, I, I started indexing the interview today. I talked to the guy who did the interview back in 86. And it's really, you know, it really symbolizes to me what it's all about, you know, is taking not just the individual story, but taking the segment within that story and actually suddenly exploding it, you know, or, or, or just sort of completely empowering that moment with a whole another set of meaning now in terms of public history and its potential. So, so as we sort of go through, I do want to open the floor up for questions and have enough time for that. So, so that's kind of um, OMS. It's kind of what we're working on in terms of trying to enhance access to it and, and, and really create empower users to create a connection with oral history. Um, are there any 
questions, comments, suggestions? <laughs>